introduce you to uh, Manuel Dos Santos Diaz. Manuel uh, is going to do a presentation of his uh, recent work on different magnetic properties of uh, nanostructures, which is his field of expertise. Uh, but before doing so, let me just say a few words about Manuel, because uh, uh, I may met him recently and was very much uh, interested in the works that he presented in the seminars that I listened to. Uh, he has a background that starts uh, in Portugal. Uh, he got a, a bachelor degree in physics in 2007. And then uh, he moved to United Kingdom, University of Warwick, where he worked during five years uh, under the supervision of Professor Julie Stanton. And then in 2012, uh, once he got a PhD degree, he moved to Julich. And since then, he's been postdoc and now becomes senior postdoc at the Peter Grubeck Institute and he's working uh, in the group of uh, Samir Lunis. So as it is uh, written there, he's going to do this presentation. And last but not least, uh, I want to say that the reason why he's doing this presentation today is because I convinced him to apply for an ICAPAS research fellowship. So one of the purposes of this talk is that you know what he's doing and uh, you can become interested, interested in collaborating with him in case he will end up coming here. So as I think that we are more or less five, time, uh, five minutes past the hour, I uh, leave the word to Manuel and uh, suggest or uh, that you wait until the end of the presentation to raise questions, either using the, the question and answer or raising hand. And for that, we will have to wait approximately 45 minutes. Okay, Manuel? Yeah, thank Please. you, Andres, for the introduction. So I hope the pointer is visible. So in this talk, I'm going to give you some highlights of my research on magnetism, spin dynamics and transport at the nanoscale. And like Andres was saying, this is work that I've been doing here at the Peter Grumet Institute. So let me first uh, start by saying, where is the Peter Grumman Institute? If you look for Julich, it's hard to see on the map because it's a fairly small town on the Western border of Germany, but it hosts a very large research center, which is the research center Julich. We have more than 6,000 people working here. And I'm in the Peter Grumman Institute for the Quantum Theory of Materials, which is a large theoretical institute that has around 40 people right now. And within it, I'm in the research group of uh, Samir Lunis, it's called the Funsi Lab. We usually have a couple of postdocs and some PhD students, and we have different uh, running projects. So the, then the plan for the talk is to give you an introduction to the kind of things that I do, and then to give you some highlights of different topics, starting with magnetic atoms on surfaces, then how we describe spin excitations, our recently discovered chiral multi-spin interactions, and our understanding of spin waves at the nanoscale. Then at the end, I will give you some perspectives of other things that are also possible and could develop my research further. So let's start with the introduction. One possible way of starting is to think of spintronics, which is the field that explores the spin of the electron as the fundamental degree of freedom. And here I'm showing an example for a ferromagnetic uh, layer on top of a heavy metal. And we know that in this case, the combination of ferromagnetism with spin orbit coupling will lead to several interesting effects. So we can have uh, spin hole effects, but also this interface between these two materials can lead different, to different um, phenomena. This was already um, the reason for the Nobel Prize given to Fertin Grunberg for the giant magnetic resistance, because then it gives you electrical access to this magnetic information, for example, stored in such ferromagnetic layers. But if you look at the current trends, one idea is to replace the ferromagnet with an antiferromagnet for spintronics. Here's an example for copper manganese arsenide. And the advantage here is that antiferromagnets, for example, have much faster dynamics. So you could imagine that everything could happen on a much faster time scale, which would be good if you want to process information faster. Another possibility is to use, instead of uh, uniform magnetic states, to use, for example, domain walls or magnetic skirmions. 
which are uh, and depicted here. And these are sort of vortex like um, quasi particles that exist in a ferromagnetic background and they are very stable. And you can see that in here, this tiny dot, white dot is a skirmion that under the action of an electric current can move in the material. So these magnetic currents themselves can be seen as mobile magnetic bits. So these are some ideas from spintronics. And if you make things small and go to the nanoscale, you'll see that these concepts are already being explored, for example, with the scanning tunneling microscopy. So here I have two examples. I have antiferromagnetic chains that were studied with STM and shown that you can encode magnetic information in the two types of nail states. And on the right here, I'm showing nanoskirmions. So these are very small skirmions that are just a few nanometers across. And these were also investigated with spin polarized STM. So you see that these concepts of spintronics are also present at this atomic scale. More recently, there is a lot of excitement in this discovery of two-dimensional magnets, for example, chromium triiodine. And these are magnetic down to a single layer and can be combined in heterostructures as shown in this prototypical device here. This is a magnetic tunnel junction and you see the switch on between a high conductance and low conductance when the magnetic state of the junction is changed by varying the magnetic field. One thing that I find interesting in this experiment is that in the tunneling conductance itself, there are some signatures that you can find for small bias voltages that are probably telling you there are strong interactions between the tunneling electrons and magnets in these materials. So this is the context for my research. So I work in these nanostructures on surfaces, but also in thin films and bulk materials and on the properties of magnetic skirmions. And a strong focus of my research is on spin excitations. So to bridge all of this, I use a quantum mechanical theory, which is based on density functional theory and time dependent density functional theory. And from here, I can expand in two directions. So from DFT, I can uh, extract information for uh, tight binding models to describe electronic properties or for spin Hamiltonians for the magnetic properties. On the other side, because I have the dynamics directly from TDDFT, I have uh, information from the spin dynamics and for the spectroscopy directly without having to build a model. So how is this uh, possible? It uh, needs a lot of method development. And this is a specialty of our institute in Ulich. So we do a lot of development in codes concerning density functional theory. So here I'm showing a family of codes based on the Coringa con Rostocker method. And this can tackle anything from bulk uh, to thin film surfaces, impurities. The KKR nano code can handle thousands of atoms and scales to our largest uh, supercomputer. And these give you information about the ground state and the magnetic exchange interactions. In my case, I'm the main developer of this uh, KKR SUS code that implements time dependent density functional theory. And it has this unique combination of describing spin excitations together with spin orbit coupling that we can level up with many body perturbation theory to describe inelastic electron tunneling. So, this is our DFT side of things. And from here, we connect to our atomistic spin dynamics code spirit, which you can try easily via some web interface. But we also have direct access to my, uh, magnon properties, as I will show later. And on the tight binding side, we are developing a very powerful general purpose tight binding code called Titan. This can access different spintronics properties. And the most recent developments are in real time ultra fast dynamics and on how to combine magnetism with superconductivity. I will also show some brief highlights. So the first uh, topic that I want to discuss in more detail are uh, on the magnetic atoms and clusters on surfaces that we did together with the um, STM groups uh, of Alex Kajiturins and Jens Wiebe at a time in uh, Hamburg. So I visited the, the lab of Alex in Nijmegen, and this is a scanning tunneling microscope, I'm told. It's a very complicated machine. But if you look inside the actual STM, it's a very sharp piece of wire that you make as sharp as possible. This is an electron microscope image. And you see that in the end, it's uh, a little bit roundish. So it's not surprising that in theory, we focus only on this part, so this fairly roundish uh, STM tip above a surface, while the machine is much more complicated. So starting from this uh, theoretical picture, let me give you the basics for inelastic STM. We have our magnetic, you have our tip with the, some electrons that will try to tunnel to the surface, and we have some uh, magnetic entity below that will affect the tunneling processes. So depending on the alignment between the two spins, you can have, for example, high conductance in one case, maybe low conductance in the other case. More interesting for my talk is going to be the third process, which is 
this exchange of spin and energy between the tunneling electrons and the magnetic entity below the tip. And this will lead to these typical steps because there is a minimum energy to trigger the excitation. And as you can see in this example for an iron atom on copper nitride, you see a sequences of steps in the tunneling conductance, which is measured. And if you follow how they evolve in the magnetic field, you can actually extract all the information about such a quantum spin model that describes this iron atom. On the theoretical side, we want to calculate properties of these nanostructures on surfaces. So we are using this uh, KKR green function method that I already explained. And this is uh, found here. But for this uh, study, there are two advantages. One is we have flexibility with the boundary conditions because we have a green function method. So we can define a region on the surface where we place our cluster and uh, include some portion of the surface. But outside, we use boundary conditions that match to the perfect surface. So there is no additional repetition of this nanostructure. The second advantage for these studies is the access to the magnetic exchange interactions. Here we use perturbation theory. We start from a reference magnetic configuration, make a small deviation, and by comparing the two, we can extract the corresponding magnetic interactions. So let me show you how this works, starting with just single iron atoms on platinum. This is a top view of the platinum one-on-one -on -one surface, and you find the atoms are in these threefold coordination sites. But with respect to the subsurface, you see that the environment can be one of two. Either you find these subsurface atoms here, this is the FCC site, or they are not because it's actually underneath, and then it's the HCP case. And these two are found to have very different properties. So if you look at the FCC case, you see that this excitation energy increases linearly with the magnetic field. In the HCP case, First, nothing, nothing seems to be happening, and then it finally picks up energy. So what's happening here is that although we have the same atom on the surface, and it seems that there is not much difference, actually the magnetic anisotropy energy is completely different. So in one case, the FCC side has an easy axis anisotropy, so the field is parallel to the anisotropy axis, and so the energy immediately increases. In the HCP case, they are perpendicular, you have an easy plane, and then it takes some uh, magnetic field until the magnetic moment rotates to the out-of-plane configuration, and then the energy can increase again. The other thing you can see here from our calculations is that the value of the magnetic anisotropy energy depends a lot on how many platinum atoms are affected by the uh, iron atom. And you see that it takes up to 80, maybe more platinum atoms. So it's a non-local quantity, and a lot of platinum atoms contribute to this energy. As a second example, if we bring uh, two iron atoms to some distance of each other, we can measure and we can also calculate the interactions between them. And we found that there are two main types in this case, the usual Heisenberg coupling, but also this uh, chiral georgiansky mori interaction could be detected. And this we could also compare with the experiment. Here's the Heisenberg coupling and here's the strength of the DMI. And you see that it can go up to two nanometers. So these interactions on the surface can have very long range and you need a special method in order to be able to access such separations. As a third example, we bring three iron atoms together, make them close to each other, and we can make trimers. In this case, we can make actually four types of trimers, depending on where the atoms are placed on the surface. And if I focus on this FCC top trimer, actually the experiment saw that while imaging, you could see switches. So what this means is that on the relatively slow time scale of the measurement, you could see the switch between up and down of the magnetic states of this trimer. So these three iron atoms are actually found to be bistable on the time scale of seconds. This you can see a little bit better in this image here from this other study where you see the switches between the two states of the trimer. And in this study, what we wanted to understand is what happens if you have nearby atoms at some small but not so small distance, can they influence the stability of the trimer and can we manipulate uh, the stability via the environment? So in experiment, different structures were built. And uh, you see here a schematic of where these atoms are actually arranged with respect to the surface. And it turns out that if you look at the, the lifetimes as a function of the applied bias voltage, the gray dots correspond to the isolated trimer. Most of these other structures with more iron atoms have less stability. 
So more does not mean better. We found that uh, only when this uh, threefold symmetry is preserved, as in this case here, or in this case here, does the stability jump up. So even if you make some small mistake, as long as the symmetry is approximately threefold, you still have an increase in the stability. So how can we explain this? So why, why is this environment, uh, depending on the symmetry, so crucially? It turns out that there is a third type of interaction, which is important here. This is an, an isotropy of the exchange interaction, which is different from the Jarzinski moria And what this generates is an effective transverse anisotropy or in-plane magnetic anisotropy between the ad atom and the trimer. And when this vanishes, which is the case for the threefold symmetry, then you find the increase in stability. And in other cases, this will lead to a destabilization of the trimer. So let me now explain how we can uh, calculate uh, observed spin excitations. So this we have to um, use um, a dynamical theory such as time-dependent density functional theory. This was done to bulk ferromagnets using the adiabatic um, local spin density approximation already a while ago. And the key object here is the dynamical magnetic susceptibility. But how does this relate to this uh, picture of the STM that I showed you before? So if you look again at this process, we have to identify the ingredients that are shown in this schematic. So this magnetic surface, we already described the static properties with DFT. Now we will need to know how does it change that dynamically. And concerning this interaction here, we model it as an exchange coupling. So the tunneling electron creates some exchange coupling to the magnetic moment. And so the connection between the two is given by the dynamic magnetic susceptibility. This relation within the TDDFT takes two ingredients. One is the dynamical susceptibility of the quantum electrons. And here are the exchange correlation effects that build back the interacting susceptibility. What we did was to um, develop a full theory of this inelastic scanning tunneling spectroscopy together with this dynamical magnetic susceptibility and including the effects of spin width coupling. And this is a very unique thing that I haven't seen reported in other works. The key problem with these calculations is that we have um, systematic errors which are very hard to get rid of. So our energies of interest, as you saw in the experiment, are very low. They are milli electron volts. But when you are computing these different quantities, the typical error is also in a similar um, order of magnitude. So when you combine these two objects together, you will have an error which is unpredictable. And the way to correct this is known in the case without spin orbit coupling. There is a certain sum rule that connects the different ingredients, the ground state spin density, the static quantum susceptibility, and the exchange correlation magnetic field. This comes from the existence of a Goldstone mode with, without spin orbit coupling. So this you really have to enforce numerically. In the case of spin orbit coupling, all of this has to be reevaluated with spin orbit coupling. And you will have to calculate an additional quantity, which is a bit complicated, so I'm not showing here, that comes directly from spin orbit coupling and generalizes this sum rule. So if this is enforced, you can trust in the numbers coming from your calculation. And you can also generalize this to non-collinear states. If you try to interpret your calculation, you can think of it as the magnetic moment, for example, of the atom might be recessing under the influence of the tunneling electrons. And in this semi-classical picture, you have that the evolution has two terms, has a precession term around some effective magnetic field, but it's also important to consider relaxation effects. So there is a damping of this motion and it will relax back to the ground state. The key quantity here is this effective magnetic field that comes from the energy of the system. For a simple example, for the iron atom, we have the uniaxial anisotropy, the external field. So the effective field has then two contributions. And we can derive what is the form of the dynamical susceptibility to an external perturbation. And you find these typical Lorentzian shapes. And if you study such uh, shapes, you can find two main informations. One is what is the resonance frequency and what is the line width. The resonance frequency, you can see that it relates to the strength of this effective field. This is how you extract information about anisotropies or magnetic interactions. And the relaxation comes here. So this is where the line width comes from. And it tells you how strong is the coupling between the magnetic moment and the conducting electrons. 
if I show you again these iron atoms on platinum and um, give you some numbers for this dynamical part, in this case, because of spin-orbit coupling, this is a little bit more general. So it's not just a single number. You have two different numbers for the relaxation here on the diagonal. And there is a new term that will appear in the calculations that you see here in blue. And these terms give you a correction to the precession frequency. This we can get from our TDDFT calculations, having the magnetic moments out of plane or in plane. We can again find the ground state magnetic and isotopy energies, but I want to focus on these elements here. So on the diagonal, it's the relaxation parameters that you see have a little bit of an isotropy, but are also strongly dependent on where, where you put your atom on the surface. While these blue elements, the correction to the precession, are much more isotropic and do not depend so much on where the atom sits on the surface. So this kind of information will help you understand the shape of these steps seen in experiment. We can also do a, a more direct comparison if we elevate the theory to the level of many body perturbation theory and introduce the interaction between electrons and spin excitations. So here the main concept is the uh, self-energy that describes, for example, lifetime effects of the electrons. And I'll show you an example for an iron atom on copper. There are two main ingredients here. So I already described this picture of spin excitation. So you have these Lorentzians telling you where the spin excitations are and what is the lifetime. And you need to use also information about the electronic states of the atom near the Fermi energy. Once you combine the two, you can calculate the self-energy and you find these typical steps in the imaginary part. So you go from low um, broadening to high broadening of the states and uh, when you cross over the energy of the spin excitation. If you want to compare to experiment, then you have to take your self-energy and find how is the electronic structure changed by it. And this is what you do if you solve the Dyson equation. And then you can look at the electronic structure in the vacuum region where you expect the STM tip to be located. And you indeed find these steps as seen in experiment that come from the spin excitations. You do find a strange feature here. So this is a many body resonance that we are calling a spin around. And you, you see that uh, you cannot relate it to the spin excitations. There's nothing here. And if you look carefully, you see that it also does not appear for negative bias. So this will only appear on one side of the spectrum. And it comes from the strong interaction between the electrons and the spin excitations, which is encoded only at the level of the Dyson equation. If you include this with spin orbit coupling, you even find some very tantalizing quantile-like signatures as reported in our recent work. So now let me move to the next topic, which is to introduce a new family of chiral multispin interactions. And this will still be connected to these atoms on surfaces. So our general concept is that uh, if we look at, um, for example, skirmions, we need to know different types of magnetic interactions to know what kind of magnetic structure is feasible for the system. But this is not the only way that you can get interesting magnetic states. As uh, shown in these two examples, this is a non-collinear triple Q state for a manganese monolayer on copper. This is the nanoskermion lattice that was found for an iron monolayer on iridium. These do not come from the DMI directly, but come from so-called four spin interactions, where you combine four spins together instead of two, as in this case. And these lead to these multi-Q states. But if you look at this equation, and at this equation you realize, well, what if we have one cross product in this type of four spin interactions? So are there chiral four spin interactions? It turns out that there are, but first we have to be able to compute them. So we developed a method called the self-consistent spin cluster expansion. And the idea is to extract all of these parameters for the magnetic interactions. So for the two spin interactions, these are nine parameters for the small tensor here. If you generalize to four spin, you have a more complicated object that could have up to 81 parameters. To get this from uh, the density functional theory, you use the spin cluster expansion. It's a systematic way of constructing the energy landscape. And then we use constraint density functional theory to evaluate the corresponding energies. This uh, we do by pointing each magnetic moment in 14 independent directions, finding out all possible configurations. And then we use symmetry to reduce how many we have to calculate. This we applied first for dimers and platinum. And already here, we made the first discovery that besides the usual interactions, there was a new type of interaction called the chiral bicrotic interaction that is actually quite strong. 
So if you look at the form of this interaction, you see that it's kind of a mix between the Heisenberg interaction and the jaroszynski mori interaction. If we look at the numbers, just to convince you, these are different dimers on platinum, you see that it's always quite substantial compared to the jaroszynski mori interaction. You should compare chiral to chiral. In terms of the symmetry, we have this mirror plane here for the dimer. And this means that these interaction vectors, according to the rules of Moria, have to be contained in this mirror plane. But they don't have to be parallel. Actually, they can have an angle between them, as uh, seen most dramatically for the cobalt dimer. And this means that the plane in which the spins can't would depend on the relative balance between these two vectors. If we try to make this a bit more systematic, just to understand what is out there, we can uh, develop this in a diagrammatic fashion. So we expand the energy in terms of the different contributions. If we have a magnetic moment, let's say here, another magnetic moment on side two, and you mediate the interaction by exchanging electrons between them, the lowest order contribution will give you the Heisenberg exchange. If you do this to the next order, you will find three different contributions, depending on how many sides you manage to connect. And these are the isotropic for spin interactions. If you now bring spin orbit coupling into the picture, so the electron is traveling from site one to site two, but it passes by some heavy atom, to first order in spin orbit coupling, you will find the jaroszynski mori interaction. So now you can guess that if you have all these four spin interactions and go to the right and put spin orbit coupling to first order, you have our chiral bicardic interaction that I just uh, showed you, but there should also be three side and four side versions of the corresponding isotropic interactions. All of these you can combine with point group symmetry, and then you can define your effective Hamiltonian for the system. I'm showing here just one example for the trimers on platinum, where you have more symmetry, you have more mirror planes and more rotations. And now I want to give you a quick understanding of how does this interaction act on this uh, trimer. So you see here, one, two, this is our cross product. And then two, three is the dot product. If you try to apply a symmetry operation to this interaction, for example, this mirror plane, you will get this picture. So the cross product stays where it was, but now the dot product moves to the other side of the trimer. This means you get a new chiral three side interaction vector, two, one, three, and it's not the same as the initial one. So you cannot compare the two and say something about the symmetry properties. And it turns out that in this uh, particular case on the surface, the, there is a missing mirror plane that would allow for this comparison. This is not present. And this is why when you look at how these interaction vectors are arranged around the trimer, they are not contained in the mirror planes anymore. This was the previous case for the DMI and for the chiral bicardic interaction, but they can have a non moria component, which is perpendicular to the mirror planes. This we can then verify numerically by calculating different trimers on platinum. First, I will highlight the moria contributions to the interactions. So these are the Jaroszynski moria the chiral quadratic and two components of the chiral three side. And the combination of them will, si will say whether you have one chirality or the other for the magnetic structure. The non-Moria interaction is here and it only appears for the three side interaction. And this wants to do something very strange. It would like one of the magnetic moments to point out of the plane of the trimer. The other two are more or less in plane. And in this way, it can gain energy from two sides of the trimer. Just to show you that something different is really possible, I'm distributing just this interaction on an hexagonal lattice. And I'm asking what kind of magnetic structure would this interaction favor? And you see that it favors this kind of force of lattice structure. One spin points up, three of the other spins are almost in the plane, but also point a little bit up. And this type of magnetic state is very similar to the one that was predicted for the manganese monolayer on copper. The difference is that this is a fully compensated antiferromagnetic structure, so zero net magnetic moment, while here these triangles have a small upward scanting, so this one also has a ferromagnetic component. Now let's um, take this um, idea of looking at extended magnetic systems and ask what about dynamics in such magnetic monolayers or thin films? So the, this uh, started uh, from an uh, interaction with some uh, expert in our institute that uh, does uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy experiments. And this had, it seems a little bit surprising that you can use 
this type of experiment to look at spin waves. Actually, it was the, the first experiment that could show that the Jaffe's Cambrian interaction can be detected from the asymmetry in the spin wave dispersion, as uh, shown in the paper and compared to theory. And here the idea is that spin waves that propagate in opposite directions will have a different energy if you have Jaffe's Cambrian interaction acting on them. And this was the idea that was used to quantify the strength of the DMI here. The expert in our institute is Harald Imbach, and he was doing very careful experiments for cobalt uh, thin films on tungsten and other materials. And you could see in the spectra, this is the real data, there are different peaks, and there are several spin wave modes that could be identified. So we wanted to understand, can we really predict and uh, quantify from theory what kind of spin wave modes should you observe in these materials? The problem with cobalt on tungsten is that it grows in a reconstructed form. And you, you see on the unit cell here that you need at least five cobalt atoms to match four tungsten atoms. So this makes it more complicated from the theoretical side. But we can do this. We have uh, the codes for this. For the spin waves, we have to use linear spin wave theory. And then we have to provide the ingredients for the linear spin wave equation. These are the magnetic moments but also the information about the magnetic interactions. So this is the easy part that you can easily get, but the magnetic interactions are problematic for such metallic ferromagnets because they are long range. So you really have to include magnetic interactions up to fairly large distances. These are maps of the interactions for different layers, for different thicknesses of the film. And you can see that they are really long range and even the symmetry changes, whether you are close to tungsten or you are on the free surface of the film. If you have all this information, then you can solve this equation numerically, find your um, spin wave modes, and so you can have access to the intrinsic spin wave spectrum. These are the spin wave energies, and then the information about the profile of the modes is contained in the eigenvectors. But this is not enough to compare with experiment. You actually have to do one additional step. You have to remember that uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy is a diffraction experiment, so there will be an additional unfolding of the intrinsic spectrum. This I'm going to illustrate here for you. So if you have eight cobalt layers without tungsten, you will find eight spin wave bands. This is what you then expect just from counting how many magnetic atoms you have. If you place your eight cobalt on six tungsten, let's say a thin film kind of calculation, you will have 80 spin wave modes. These are all the gray lines in the background. This is because per layer, you have 10 cobalt atoms. So in total, in this calculation, you have 80 cobalt. But if you take into account this last step, this unfolding of the spin wave spectra due to the diffraction, you find again just eight visible modes out of this whole background of gray curves. And you have two main differences. One is this lower mode separates compared to the previous freestanding case. And the energies of the uh, higher modes can also be different thanks to the presence of tungsten. We also made a direct comparison with experiment uh, with the available uh, data. And we overall find a very good agreement showing that this uh, procedure actually works. But uh, what we were thinking was, if we can do this so nicely for ferromagnetic films, what if we don't have a ferromagnet, but if you have a more complicated magnetic structure, what would you see in experiment? So now I'll discuss a little bit more how the experiment works. You have a, a beam of electrons that in principle you can make spin polarized and these electrons come into the surface where you can have an arbitrary magnetic state. They will scatter. They could, for example, create a spin wave excitation and these scattered electrons will then have a different spin state but also a different energy. And this you can analyze. And this is the part which is not available so far, which is to study the spin of the outgoing electrons. So if you could do this experiment in practice, you would have additional information about these spin waves in such complicated structures, for example, a skirmian lattice. So here I'm showing the main information that you'll see in this case. So depending on the spin of the incoming and outgoing electron, you have three types of scattering channels. These are the non-spin flip scattering channels, the dominant spin flip one, and the secondary spin flip one. If you had a ferromagnet, you would only have this middle panel, and you'd see this parabolic type of spin wave excitation um, mode. But in this case, because we have this non-collinearity, 
you find signal also in the non-spin flip channel and in the other weaker spin flip channel. If we look at the three types of modes, let's say we focus on the gamma point and start at the lowest energy mode here, which appears in this uh, channel, this is actually the clockwise mode for the skirmian lattice. If we go higher in energy, we go to this point here in the other scattering channel. This is the breathing mode of the skirmian lattice. And if we go even higher in energy to this point here, you find the counterclockwise modes of the skirmian lattice. So having this uh, spin analysis would help you disentangle different types of spin wave modes, even uh, the well-known uh, skirmian lattice modes. As a final example for spin waves, I'll just quickly highlight this uh, work we did recently for bulk manganese 5 silicon 3. This was now in combination with inelastic neutron scattering. And this material is uh, an example of what happens in uh, practice with relatively simple compounds. So we have a little bit of manganese, we have a little bit of silicon, and it crystallizes in a relatively simple structure with very complicated magnetic behavior. So some of the manganese atoms don't even have a magnetic moment. Some of the other ones where you'd expect a magnetic moment to exist don't seem to have one. And then the remaining magnetic moments can order themselves in different phases. And this uh, collinear antithermitic phase here actually exists only at intermediate temperature. And this is the temperature where the experiment was performed. And what was uh, seen, and that's what we explained with our calculations, is that near the magnetic back peak, you have the main uh, antithermitic mode. And this is split on a much smaller energy scale into two types of modes called alpha and beta. And the splitting comes from the magnetic and isotropy energy. And uh, there is a very small difference between these two modes, depending on how they are precessing in this anisotropy field of the material. If you look to uh, experiment and see how the energies depend on the magnetic field, one of the modes does not care at all about the magnetic field, while the energy of the other mode is made to increase and they even cross at some intermediate value. So what's happening here is that the magnetic field will couple to these two antiferromagnetic modes in a different way and gives you control to these um, uh, resonances. What you can also see if you look a little bit more carefully is that we also have a mismatch here. So while in theory we would expect these modes to appear at much higher energy, they are found to be at much lower energy in experiment. So this is a challenge for theory because this uh, magnetic phase only exists at finite temperature. So the, the problem here could be that we cannot describe the spin waves at finite temperature that accurately with the available density functional theory information. So now let me just uh, close by uh, showing you some other um, uh, possibilities for research, but just very quickly. So the first one would be to focus on, also on the orbital part of the magnetism, not just on the spin. So in this work, what I did was to explore what are the orbital properties of such skirmions with parameters that are realistic. And here the idea is that there is a contribution to the orbital magnetic moment that comes without spin orbit coupling and comes from having a non-collinearity of the magnetic moments. So these you can map for this uh, skirmion. You can see here the distribution of these orbital magnetic moments in real space. And if you sum them up, you can find a total magnetic moment, orbital moment, that depends on the type of skirmion that you have, but becomes independent of the radius of the skirmion. And this hints that this is really a topological property. And if this could be extracted from XMCD measurements, then you'd have a handle on the type of skirmion that you have already with this type of technique. Another possibility that I mention now in connection to this manganese 5 silicon 3 is we have a way of handling magnetic materials at finite temperature. So this is called the disordered local moment approach. And the idea is to use density functional theory to directly carry out these averages of statistical physics over magnetic configurations. I'm, I'm not going to explain the, the, the procedure, but I'm going to show you the kind of information that you get from here. So this is an example for manganese antimony. This is a, it's a predicted uh, half metal that was actually found experimentally here. And in half metals, you have a, a particular property that the spin polarization at the Fermi energy is 100%. And this was uh, first discovered for this material, nickel manganese antimony. But there is this other aspect that uh, 
This only holds at zero temperature. Once you heat up the material and the magnetic moments start to fluctuate, as in this picture, actually this 100% spin polarization will disappear. And how it disappears, we can uh, obtain from this theory, and you can see that it drops rather quickly in the case of nickel manganese antimony, and it's much more robust in our new compound. So this idea we also applied much more recently to understand the complicated magnetism of manganese germanium. Here, the main feature is that it has a very short uh, spatial period of its non-collinear magnetic order, just between two and three nanometers. This you cannot explain with Jaroszewski marine interaction, but you can explain via this um, frustrated exchange energy landscape that we found from our calculations. And in manganese uh, germanium, the actual structure might look more like this in three dimensions. And this comes from having multi-spin interactions at play. But we, the problem we have so far is that for bulk materials, we don't know which multi-spin interactions are actually generating such a magnetic structure. So this is still an open question. Another way of uh, analyzing manganese germanium would be to calculate directly the total energies for different complex three-dimensional structures. And this is an initial work that uh, shows that this is possible using our KKR nanocode that can handle really thousands of atoms. The other topic that we've been covering uh, recently is the combination of magnetism and superconductivity, which is very difficult from the density functional theory point of view. So in this uh, experiment, iron atoms and other atoms were placed on the rhenium surface. And what you find here is that within this uh, gap of rhenium shown in the dashed line, there are special in-gap states. These are yushi Barusinov in-gap states that come from the interaction between the magnetic moments and the Cooper pairs. And the thing we could do with our um, TDDFT approach was to calculate the quantum coupling strength that is related to the binding energy of these in-gap states. More recently, uh, um, uh, Jens uh, persuaded his student to make these very long chains of um, iron, which then they were terminated with cobalt atoms. And in this case, there are two ingredients that come together. The chain itself is non-collinear. The superconductivity is coming from the surface. And all this together would, in principle, allow for topological superconductivity. So there were found some experiment, some uh, localized states at the edge of the chain in the gap of the superconductor. And we were trying to understand if they could be Majorana in-gap states. And our uh, feeling so far is that probably not, but it's very difficult to arrive at the conclusion, even with this level of modeling. And the last thing that I would like to advertise is our multipurpose uh, Titan code, which is a tight binding code that can handle dynamical properties. For example, for spintronics, um, I'm showing just two pictures for the magnetic resistance and the, the hollow conductivity as a function of the rotations of the thermionic magnetization. And this was also applied um, to evaluate spin orbit torques. But here, the interesting directions are to go directly in real time and to start exploring ultra-fast spin dynamics. This is the action of a, a laser pulse on bulk nickel and how it affects the different contributions to the magnetic moment. And we are also trying to solve this issue of how to combine magnetism with superconductivity in a self-consistent way so that we can answer questions about proximity effects, these in-gap states that I mentioned before, and also spintronic transport properties. So this was all a lot. So let me try to summarize and uh, give you some take home messages. So I showed you a bottom up approach to describe the properties of complex magnets. This is a material specific theory that goes in different levels. So you can start from the ground state, look at the dynamics, and then combine the two within many body perturbation theory. I gave you examples for the calculation of magnetic interactions, also spin dynamics with spin orbit coupling. I showed you different types of uh, materials, um, ad atoms, dimers, trimers on surfaces, some examples for thin films, some properties of skirmions. And it's important, at least for me, to always compare to experiment when available, because this is the material specific angle of the theory. So I would like to go from here in a uh, few different directions. What is missing so far within TDDFT is to describe these non-collinear states directly and to evaluate the spin dynamics. So this we know how to do at this model level, but we cannot do this yet at the TTDFT level. 
It would also be interesting to look at inelastic transport contribution. So for example, in this uh, prototype magnetic tunnel junction with chromium triodine, they have signals of magnons in the tunneling conductance. Can we do something about it? And I think the answer is yes. So in general, we would also have to go beyond the standard machinery to describe magnetic insulators. So we need to describe electron correlation effects to be able to access the spin excitations. And all of this is then pointing into a multi-scale approach towards general quantum materials with a focus on magnetic properties. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention and also to all the collaborators that you saw in all the previous papers that I showed in this talk. Okay, Manuel, thanks a lot for this uh, tremendous amount of information. I'm really impressed about the whole uh, project that you presented here today. I think that we now have a chance to raise uh, questions and comments to Manuel. And for that, uh, I would suggest that you either raise your hand using this uh, raise hand utility or write a line in the chat as you like. So uh, is there uh, any questions or comments at the moment? Okay, then I, I will try to warm up a little bit the audience. And uh, one of, in the second part of your presentation, you introduce this um, quadratic terms uh, in which up to four spin interactions appear. Mm -hmm. And you show us that, for example, in the particular case of an iron trimer, uh, this uh, can give rise to a significant contribution comparable to the two-spin uh, asymmetric uh, standard, let's say, the Alusiski morillo term. Mm -hmm. Now, while you were presenting that, I before you show the whole hexagonal lattice, I thought that this interaction, without thinking very much about them, in the periodic system will tend to cancel, but you show a very nice example in which just this was not the case. Now, my question is a little bit technical. How uh, reliable are your uh, let's say, uh, DFT calculations uh, to uh, extract uh, these uh, C parameters, D parameters, so that you can more or less uh, state clearly that there is a clear difference. I include this, let's say, next four, uh, four spin interaction terms mm -hmm. with respect to the previous, and I do see a significant difference that I can uh, certify it has a physical meaning. Can you comment on that? So the, the way we are doing the calculations is by comparing the energies of different magnetic arrangements. So we know from there if um, there is something missing to the energy or not, if you take only a subset of these interactions. So one thing uh, you can tell from there is if there is um, a big piece of, let's say, energy missing, then these interactions are important. Now the question is, what are they important for? So it could be that uh, in this, let's say, global energy landscape, they are important. But if you are near some magnetic configuration, for example, if you are in this arrangement here, maybe they are not so important or they are not obviously important because you, you cannot tell that they are actually present. So you could quantify, if you use, for example, the other method of perturbation theory, what would be the effective interactions, let's say in this arrangement, and you'd get an effective Jaroszynski-Mori interaction. But this would contain, in principle, contributions from these higher order terms. But you do not uh, have a way of separating it if you have only this, let's say, local view of the energy landscape. So in experiment, if you try to say, how big are they? How can we find them? So one possibility is really, well, if you have a magnetic state that you cannot explain otherwise. But if you have uh, maybe a conventional material, you have this other possibility that uh, if you avoid Moria's rules, and there is still an effect. So for example, imagine you have a material that has inversion symmetry, then no DMI, no chiral quadratic, but this little guy here could survive because it does not have to follow the uh, rules of Moria. In that case, maybe you can find some signature, for example, in the spin wave spectrum, you have a, a gap or something, and maybe you can tell, aha, this is impossible unless I have this particular interaction in the material. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
any other question or comment, no matter whether it's specific or general about the presentation today? Okay. If uh, that is not the case, I think that I could uh, keep going my discussion with uh, Manuel for quite some time, but uh, that we can do it in private. If uh, any of you is interested in knowing more, of course, you can contact him uh, by email or uh, indirectly just by telling me. And I hope that with this presentation, you got uh, an idea on what uh, Manuel has been doing and what he could do in the future. And occasionally, if it happens that he ends up uh, getting this uh, fellowship, I hope that he, uh, in my opinion, he could well fit in some of uh, our research groups in the center. So thanks a lot to all of you for your participation. And I wish you a nice afternoon. Enjoy the sun. Yep. Ciao. See you. Bye. Okay, then I close the 